Well, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Um, back to our second session of Creative Futures of 2022. It's so great that so many of you have come back again. Um, so thank you for giving up your evening. Um, just as a reminder, my name is Jess and I'm from the Study Hire team who's put on this event tonight um, and my job is to work with schools and young people such as yourselves to put on different events and activities like the one tonight um, to help you make informed decisions about your future and give you different types of information about different careers and different sectors that you might be interested in um, after you leave school or college. Um, tonight on Zoom, I'm sure most of you are kind of well versed in Zoom now, but just in case some of the tools we'll be using tonight include the chat feature. So if you have any questions throughout the session or any comments you'd like to make, please do pop them in the chat um, and we'll be able to answer them throughout the session. Um, another tool that we're using tonight is polls. Um, this is a really interactive session, um, so please do get involved um, and please do answer those as they pop up on your screen. Um, just to test that, I'm just going to launch a poll now, um, uh, which just asks about the types of social media that you use. So if you wouldn't, if you can see that on your screen, um, if you wouldn't mind answering anonymously to that that'd be great just to see oh fantastic i can see some of your results coming in already what's going to be the most popular oh oh instagram's in the lead at the minute <laughs> a couple more of you cool okay so hopefully you should be able to see those results on there now so instagram is just in the lead along with tiktok and something else i'm very intrigued if you if you if you know the name of that something else, if you could pop that in the chat, I'd be very intrigued to know what other platform you use. Um, but fab, thank you for taking part in that poll. So I'm delighted that tonight we are joined by Paul Brown, um, a senior journalist at the BBC, um, and Alison and the BBC Young Reporter team. Hi all, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and Paul is gonna be leading on this session. Um, as I said, it's very interactive. Paul is open to your questions. Please do get involved. Um, please put, put things in the chat um, and enjoy. But yeah, over to you, Paul, thank you. Thank you, right. Uh, I'm gonna start sharing now. Um, my own slides here. Okay. Uh, Beginning. Can, can you see that, Jess? Is that, yes. are we on? Perfect. Good. Thank right. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, I can't I can't see you, but I'm, I'm sure you're all there um, and, and listening. Thanks for giving up your evening to come, come and uh, listen to me rabbit it on. Um, we are going to go through a few, uh, for a presentation and a few exercises uh, to try and uh, discern, to get an idea about this thing we call fake news, or as we're calling it in this thing, real news, because what we're interested in is what is real and how we can distinguish between what is real and what is fake. Um, before we start, a few, a few lines on me. My name's Paul Brown. I work for a department uh, called BBC Monitoring, which is kind of a, a little known department of the BBC. We're kind of part of the world news team. We, uh, and our job is to monitor, as the name suggests, i.e. watch foreign news. So at the moment, we're watching a lot of Ukrainian news, a lot of Russian news, just to see what's going on, uh, see what information we can get out of that. And uh, the way that these that the events are in Ukraine are currently being communicated to the people in those countries. It's a really important part of it. And I'm gonna start with just a bit about the, the war in Ukraine. This is not usually part of the presentation, but we're in, introducing it now. So you're getting a, a fresh glimpse of this uh, because you know it's something that we, you, you probably have a lot of questions about. We certainly have a lot of questions about it as well. And we're watching it intensely every day. Uh, those of us in, in news coverage and there's a, there's a hell of a lot going on. Um, but I think what's important about it, I mean, about the Ukraine war and what we're talking about today is that um, this is actually an example of why it's so important to separate truth from lies online. On, because we're seeing a lot of lies going out about the about what's happening in Ukraine every day. And, and the war itself is built on a lie. Um, the lie that Ukraine is somehow a threat to Russia, that it's led by extremists. These things are not true. And, and, and what we were seeing at, at monitoring is that um, this lie is being told to Russian people, ordinary Russian people through TV, radio, and also on social media as well, although uh, to a different degree. Uh, and we also see those lies coming out from, from Russian authorities into, into the world debate, into social media through there as well. So I think it's, it's a really good example of why this is important. And we, we'll, as we go through, we'll, we'll come, come back to different things there. And if you've got any questions about that, you know, just drop them in the chat. Um, we can talk about that uh, as we go through. Um, 
Yeah, so as, as I say, the, the chat function is there. Usually we have uh, set, set um, periods where we, we have a bit of a chat and uh, ask some questions, but that's not really going to work with this format. So if you have questions, if they come to your head as we're going, just pop them in the chat and we'll take a look at them at certain points through the presentation here. Um, before we start, uh, the, here's a, a video from my colleague Mariana. She specializes in uh, looking into false information, debunking, all of these kinds of things. So she made this video for, for Newsround. I think it's a good start for what we're going to do here. So just take a look at this. Hi, Newsround. There's a lot of distressing and scary videos. Sorry, I've just realized. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Videos on social media right now as Russia invades Ukraine. And at times of confusion and when everyone's feeling frightened, that means that misleading videos can also spread. Be very wary of what your friends and family are posting online because bad and misleading information isn't helpful, even when people are just trying to help. So how can you spot what's fiction and what's fact? Look out for grainy footage. Does it look like it was filmed now in 2022 or that it might have been filmed a few years ago? We're seeing lots of old footage of conflicts being shared online, and that really isn't helpful to those people in Ukraine right now who are trying to figure out what's going on and how to keep themselves safe. Look for clues in the videos. What's the weather like? And where does it look like it was filmed? Does it look like Ukraine? Does it look like February time? If you think that the weather doesn't match up or the place doesn't match up, it possibly isn't true and isn't helpful to share. A lot of the videos and posts are very upsetting and many of them are real, but it's content that makes us really emotional and makes us react that we're often more inclined to share. And that isn't always very helpful. So make sure you pause and just don't pass anything on and don't share it unless you're absolutely certain it's true and remind your friends and family to do the same. So yeah, as she said there, um, when something big happens, like like the war in Ukraine, or you know, thinking back to the coronavirus pandemic, all this stuff, um, you tend to see a real surge of fake material online because everyone's keen to get information, and there are people out there who will put any old stuff out just to try and get clicks and likes on their social media channels. So you'll see things like this. This is one thing that we've seen. Uh, this was a, a post uh, from quite a reputed uh, Twitter account, actually. Uh, that put this video out and it says that um, Ukrainian pilot shoots down Russian attack aircraft. This was quite early on in the uh, in the conflict. Um, this this footage is is not from Ukraine. In fact, it's not even real. I don't know if, if got any gamers out there um, watching this now. This is actually from a video game called Armor Three, which I, I'm not I don't I'm not aware of. I'm more of a Mario Kart person. But um, you get this a lot, actually, video game footage being passed off as, as real life stuff. Um, it's, uh, it's something that happens a lot and it's just something to be aware of. Uh, we also see a lot of this kind of thing. This is the use of old video uh, being reused to, 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 uh, and claiming that it's, it, it, that it's new. So this was a video that... <laughs> So I'm going to pause that there. This was actually a video of some um, some fighter jets in an air show, um, and someone put that out, and they they added those sound effects of the um, of the air raid sirens. Said it was from Ukraine in, in the hope that people would be interested, would start retweeting. But um, it's you know we can we can talk a bit later about the sort of people who who share this fake material. But this is a really good example of why it's important to be careful about what you share online, uh, because imagine if you were in Ukraine and you saw that it would be very frightening for you. And it might affect the decisions you make to try and keep yourself safe, to try and keep your family safe. This is what we're talking about when we're saying that how important it is to make sure that you're sure of what you're sharing is true. So, and this, uh, finally, this is a bit of a weird one. This is a, a new kind of thing you'll see. I'm just gonna play this for a little bit. If you don't know, this is the president of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky. The Ukrainians. I'm just gonna let the camera look at Виявилося не так вже й легко. Я змушений приймати складні рішення. So what is actually saying there is that um what what well, what you'll hear him saying is that he's surrendering, uh Russia has won, all that kind of stuff. But um you might have noticed some, something strange about it there. Um his head was sort of moving strangely, like almost like it's floating, his body barely moved at all. Uh, this is what that's what we actually call a deep fake. So it's actually someone who's used special effects to make it look like someone is saying something that they didn't. 
Uh, and this one is actually quite a poor quality one. You can actually get apps on, on your phone that would probably make something better than that. Uh, but you can see, again, how something like that would be dangerous to share. Again, imagine you're in Ukraine. You switch on your phone. You see your president surrender. You don't know what's going to happen next. Um, and it's not true. So this is, a, this is really the point we're going to drive home uh, today. Um, so those are some examples from Ukraine. And we're just going to go through the main presentation now. And that's going to start with this, with this video, which kind of brings all these ideas together. Fake news. We think it's a problem. I think fake news is a problem because it can influence how people make decisions. It leaves me feeling like I don't know who to believe. And it worries me that people are growing up misinformed. And if we're misinformed, how can we understand the world around us? I think it's a problem because it leads to confusion. And we begin to mistrust all news sources. But what exactly is it? And how do we spot it? Fake news is lies and propaganda told for a political or commercial purpose which deploys digital technology, social media, new networks to go viral, to reach around the world and influence millions of people very, very quickly. So what about news that's just wrong, like when someone's just made a mistake? Mistakes can be made. Journalists sometimes make mistakes too. Or sometimes you might be reading a story and the headline could be misleading. Or a photo in that story could have been changed in some way. It might even have been changed to make you laugh, to make you want to share it. These stories we wouldn't necessarily call fake news, but they are misleading in some ways. False stories tell us something is real when it's actually not. What about when someone tells us something is fake or false when it's actually real and true? If you're a politician who wants to close down debate, then you might use the phrase fake news because you don't want people to ask you questions about something uncomfortable. And that's a legitimate area for democratic inquiry. So it's really important that we're clear about what fake news does and doesn't mean. You're feeling confused, I'm feeling confused, right? There's all these words, fake news, hoaxes, spin. But in the end, just be aware that not everything you see online is completely true. It might be helpful to think of it, not just in black and white terms, but that there's lots of different ways that a story might be misleading or inaccurate, it might be spin. And in all of these situations, it's helpful to step back and just ask yourself, is this likely to be true? Does this feel right? Before you go on and share it on social media and pass that story along. Okay, so as my colleagues there explained, we need to be really careful when we use this term fake news uh, because the term itself isn't quite clear and can be used to mean different things. So let's just take a closer look at the three terms which, can, which might help us. And those are misinformation, disinformation and fake news. So the first one, misinformation. This is an umbrella term to, to use to describe false, misleading or out of context material, regardless of the motivation behind it. And that's the important part there. So it means that it doesn't have to be shared on purpose. And in fact, the person sharing it might not even realize the information is false or misleading. And it can simply be a mistake. Uh, this can also be, be described as bad information. And in a moment, we'll have a look at some examples of this. Uh, disinformation. Now, this is the kind of thing that we're more interested in. This is a deliberate attempt to mislead using material that the deceiver knows is untrue. So that the point is that there's intent there to mislead people. Uh, and that could be for a number of reasons. It could be to get people to think a certain way, to vote a certain way. It could also uh, be used to get people to send money, those kind of things. Uh, we've all heard of clickbait as well. So that's the kind of thing we're talking about there. So although this term uh, fake news might seem obvious at first it's really not uh, in fact uh, you know politicians we've seen politicians using it all over the world as a term of an insult against their opponents or a way to dismiss stories that they simply don't like or no matter whether the story is true or not 
So it's become a phrase that people use to obscure or hide the truth. And many researchers and journalists have increasingly moved away from this phrase, fake news. And in fact, you'll notice that the title of this workshop is real news rather than fake news, because what we're interested in is finding out what is real. That's what we do as journalists uh, and how we can spot what's true and what's accurate. Uh, we'll go through some exercises a bit later on, as I said, but first of all, let's have a look at the kind of people that, um, that share this fake news. Uh, so the BBC's Anti-Disinformation -Dis Unit, um, they help to spot and dis debunk misinformation and disinformation. We're very busy at the moment. Uh, they've identified seven types of people who start and spread viral misinformation. So we'll go through each one, one by one. First one is the joker. Uh, I'm sure we've all seen funny stories on, uh, on online, memes, jokes, that kind of thing. It's all a bit of a laugh. Um, so uh, at the start of the coronavirus pandemic, there was this, um, this WhatsApp voice note that went viral. And in it, a, claim, a man claimed that the government was cooking a giant lasagna, there's a lasagna, in Wembley Stadium to feed Londoners. <laughs> It was a joke. Uh, we might feel it's not a particularly harmful thing to do, uh, but some people uh, did believe it. They, I don't know if there's people wandering around Wembley feeling hungry, but um, they would have been disappointed. Um, next, we have uh, the politician. Now, this is an interesting one. Uh, you might remember this fella, uh, former President Trump. He was filmed on cam camera um, during the pandemic, questioning whether. Exposing, exposing patients' bodies to ultraviolet light or even injecting bleach could help treat coronavirus. It can't. Uh, he later claimed he was being sarcastic, and uh, but people have started phoning hotlines to ask if they, they could treat themselves with disinfectant. And you really, really shouldn't do that. It's very, very dangerous. So th this kind of stuff can come from the top sometimes. Um, and it's not just the US president sp spreading misinformation. Uh, you know, we've seen claims, you know, just as we were talking about from Russia, uh, the, the, the leaders of Russia have, have been telling lies about, about Ukraine and their reasons for invading and the, what's actually happening in the country itself. So these things can happen. They can come from anywhere. Oh, sorry, I missed my slide on the bleach there. There you go, that's some bleach. And then there's the insider. This is when, uh, or the fake insider, I should say. This is when information seems to come from a trustworthy source with inside information, like a doctor, a professor, or a hospital worker, in the case of the pandemic, that is. But often the insider is nothing of the sort. Um, so again, during the pandemic, a woman in West Sussex created a panicky voice note on social media, predicting terrible death tolls for young and healthy coronavirus sufferers. And she seemed to have inside information through her work at an ambulance. Um, service but her claims were never supported by the trust and no one's been able to establish if she even wor worked as a health worker so that one seems unlikely to be true but you know you can see how it can cause fear among people uh this one is a slightly different the relative this is where we're, we're talking about misinformation here you remember the, the difference between misinformation and disinformation our own friends and families you know pe people uh, can sometimes share stuff with us just in case you know you could say there was a, one example of garlic uh at very early on in the pandemic that people were saying that if you ate loads of garlic that you would be immune to coronavirus yeah it's not going to work it might keep people away from you uh it might aid social distancing but it's not going to help you cure um coronavirus so uh, in these occasions it might be someone who's actually whose intentions are good but they're actually still spreading mis uh, this misinformation uh unwittingly uh then we get to this guy uh the scammer so this is a this is a really a problematic one Te uh, so we've got some examples of this text claiming to be from the government or local councils uh, we've seen those have been generated by scammers to make money from the uh, out of the pandemic. So one such scam claimed that the government was offering people relief payments and asked for bank details. Classic. Uh, so they 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 get you to share your bank details on a false pretense and then take all your money. Uh, there's also been scams around the provision of face masks and other protective equipment. And uh, finally, one of the biggest uh, ones relating to conspiracy theories, and we're seeing a lot more of this uh, through the anti-vax movement. Um, but at the early on in the pandemic, there was this uh, conspiracy, I think it's still going, around uh, 5G masks, that somehow they were being used to um, spread the disease. Um, yeah, so that's a, that's a real problem as well. Um, I, people were attacking these masks, they were you know, attacking civil infrastructure basically. And the problem with that, the knock-on effect of that is that some emergency services were using these masks to communicate. So you can instantly see how this 
this kind of fake material can cause problems. And lastly, we've got the celebrities. This is a good one. So these are people that, um, you know, they have massive platforms on social media, often, you know, in some cases aren't very careful about what they share or the kind of stuff that they put out there. And, and it can cause a real problem. Uh, the 5G conspiracy theory was one that was being uh, put out by, by celebrities. So that was a, that's a real problem as well. So those are the, the kind of things we're talking about. Um, we are now going to have another look at a little video here to, to try and kind of bring this all together. So here we go. Okay, um, right, yeah, so I, I don't have a quick look at the chat. I haven't seen any questions yet. Don't forget, you can stick your questions in there um, at any point. Um, I don't think we've got any, have we, Jess? No, not seeing anything. Okay, we'll keep going, but don't be shy, people. Um, if, you, if you want to ask anything, anything at all about what I'm saying or if anything's not clear, just give me a shout. Um, where are we? Why is my thing not working? Here we go. So now we're going to get to our first of our exercises. This will be good. Um, so we are going to go through and figure out um, if this. I'm going to give you an example of a story, a, uh, a story that was that appeared in the in the media, and we're going to see if you can figure out if it's real or fake. So hopefully you've all got your detective hats on. You can uh, you can re re be careful about all, all the details I'm going to give you here and see if they add up. Um, so you might recognise these guys. Um, yeah, One Direction. I think I think when we made this presentation, these was these were still quite a, a, a new group. But as far as I know, they've broken up and moved on to other things now. But let's pretend that we're still being modern. Um, so this is an actual headline at the in the Metro newspaper, a legitimate newspaper, and an online website. Uh, One Direction fans screamed so much at constant uh, concert, sorry, that her lung collapsed. Wow. So um, a good place to start with this is to stop and ask yourself, could this even happen? Is it possible to scream so loud at a One Direction gig or indeed any gig that you that you um, that your lung collapses? Um, I've been to gigs. I've shouted and screamed and woke up with a sore throat, but I've never woken up with a collapsed lung. Um, maybe, maybe you have, I don't know. Um, but this is a good start, you know, sort of thinks to itself, is this, is this possible? Is it possible to scream so loud that your lung collapses? Um, so let's have a look. Um, excuse me, I've lost a page on my script, so I'm going to have to add it for a bit. Um, so we've got, um, so we, the next thing you want to do is after you thought to yourself, is this real or not? Then you've got to, um, start looking at the evidence, uh, start looking around a little bit. Let's uh, start with the source here. We've got the name of the newspaper. We've got the name of the journalist. We've got a time code there, uh, 15th of October, 2017. Uh, so these are good clues to get started. This is how you can start putting the different pieces of the puzzle together. But we've also got some other evidence. We've had a look around. We've had a look at a um, One Direction fan site. And that says that One Direction haven't performed in concert since 2015. So immediately we've got a discrepancy there. We've got this site that says they haven't performed live since 2015. And then we've got this report in 2017 that says a One Direction fan screamed so loud at a concert that her lung collapsed. Um, so if this fan page is right, there's something weird about these dates that we need to think about. So I think right now, Jess, we're gonna launch our first poll. Um, and so I just want you to tell me if you think this story is true or not, just based on what we've got so far. Go for it. Awesome. 
Um, results coming in. Mm, so what happened? Okay, everyone's voted. Let's have a look at the results. Uh -huh. 90% say no, and 10% or one person says yes. Fair enough. I think actually, I think if I click, I'm going to go to a countdown that I usually have on this uh, thing. So um, we'll have to ignore that. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> yeah, ignore that. Right. Okay. Um, so yeah, so so it's very firmly in the in the fake camp there. That's interesting. Let's see if uh, anyone switches over the next few minutes as we go through some more details. So let's look at some more evidence. Let's look beyond the headline and, the, and to the article itself. So there's a picture of the band here, and here's a picture of a girl screaming. Do these pictures tell us anything? Well, not a lot, actually. They, uh, if you look closely, you'll see these pictures are from an agency called Getty, which uh, a lot of news organizations use. It's a good um, source for, for images. And they're stock pictures, which mean they, they, they aren't, not, weren't necessarily taken at the event that they're, that they're talking about. And if you look at the caption under the girl here, it says a girl not pictured screamed so much her lung collapsed. So they're being very clear that this girl here screaming is not the one who screamed till her lung collapsed. Um, so we don't even know if these pictures are recent or not. They've been quite clear about, about that. So let's look at some more evidence and read, read the actual article. Always a good thing to do. What does it actually say? So it says the 16 year old girl who was described as a super fan. Yeah. Uh, continued shouting even after she was she had started to have trouble breathing when she was taken to the children's medical center in dallas texas following the band's gig they discovered she had a tear in her lung that resulted in air seeping into her chest so we've got some details there some gory details but we've also got some interesting details for, for what we're trying to do here because we have the, the age of the girl very important and we've got a location for the hospital locations are always really good when you're trying to put these things together so let's add up what the, the evidence we've got so far. Uh, we've got the, the story itself. We've got what the fan page told us about the, them not touring um, two years before this story went out. Uh, the pictures that we have probably aren't from the actual event, but we do have the age of the girl and the name of the hospital and a location. So what do we do next? We start to look around. Uh, this is an important part of the, putting, this, putting the jigsaw together as well. Um, so we, we've searched for this story, One Direction, Lung Collapse, and we found it on the Mail, a uh, massive online website. We found it on this site called Buzz, which is an Irish news website, which is, uh, concerns itself a lot with entertainment stories. Added a little ouch to the headline there. Uh, Ventura Broadcasting Company. Uh, this is a US-based entertainment broadcaster. Uh, they're less shocked about the story itself and more in uh, more admiring the fans dedication to one direction and we've got this uh, doctors tv which is again is a u.s uh, uh channel and they got a panel on they put a panel together to ask could it happen to me uh so be careful i don't, I don't know i never saw that program so we'll i don't know what the conclusion was there so with so many people carrying the story does it give you confidence uh does it switch any of you in the no camp over into the yes camp uh, does this kind of cross-referencing help you decide if you believe it? And having looked around, adding in, in this new information, it might make you to start to believe the story a bit more. And look at this, while looking around, the, the good old BBC is also running the story. This is, uh, this is interesting. So does this make a difference to you? Does the BBC get always, uh, would you expect the BBC to get the story right? Hopefully. Uh, does the BBC make mistakes? Yes, uh, it does happen. Uh, but the point is we don't make things up. And when we do make mistakes, we own up to them very quickly as soon as it's become, become clear. It's not, it's not in our interest and it's not, and no one is in the BBC to, to spread uh, false information. So let's weigh up the, uh, oh, we've got some more evidence as well here. Uh, hang on a moment. Uh, the fan page. Now, because we know, now know where, the, where this concert was, or we've got an idea, it was in, uh, in Texas, Dallas, Texas. And this, uh, this fan page that we looked at earlier says that One Direction haven't, taught, taught, uh, haven't played in Dallas since 2014. So we've got an even, even bigger discrepancy there. We've now got three years between their last concert in Dallas and this story coming out, if the fan page is right. Uh, and yeah, we're pretty sure that she saw them in Dallas because that's the uh, hospital that she went to. That's where that was located. It's very unlikely they would have 
taken her across state lines to go to another hospital. It would have been quite a distance. So does it add up that the story would be reported in 2017, at least three years after it happened? Given everything else we've, uh, we've looked at so far, time for our second poll. Let's see if anyone's switched sides. At least one. Oh. Wow. Majority in the yes camp now saying this is true. Very interesting. Okay, that's great. That's um, I've never seen a shift like that before. That's really interesting. Um okay, so let's carry on doing what we're doing. Let's start uh, looking around a little bit more. Let's see what the BBC articles itself says. Oh, there's my stupid countdown again. Anyway, um, so we've got some details here. We've got it. Um, it was published in the Journal of Emergency Medicine. Uh, so this is an important fact here. So I'm just going to move some things around so I can see what I'm doing here. And it's the first time a case of this kind has been documented. <laughs> uh, so we've also got what, what the uh, BBC article uh, also gives us is a the... A link to the uh, journal itself. So this is an academic journal, very uh, highbrow, very clever people behind it. And uh, if we look at that a bit more closely, we can see it's, it was uh, the, the name of the paper itself that the BBC article we're talking about. It's called Screaming Your Lungs Out, a case of boy band induced uh, pneumothorax, pneumomedias, and those th those other two things as well. Um, if anyone can pronounce those, then uh, you, you win a prize. Um, so again, let's go back to it. Let's add up what we have so far. We've got a story about a girl with no name. Uh, oh, hang on a minute. I'll tell a lie. Sorry, I need to go back. Uh, so we read on in the BBC article. Sorry, I lost my place there a little while. I for a little second there. So reading on, we've got some more details in the BBC article. <laughs> This is my favorite detail of the whole thing. So the girl was treated by Dr. a guy called Dr. J. Max Slaughter. Doctor called Dr. Slaughter. <laughs> I mean, could you have not picked another career? Would you want to be treated by Dr. Slaughter? I don't know. But that's his name, that's there, it's, it's there. So uh, let's give him a Google, let's see if we can find him. J. Max Slaughter, what have we got? We've got a Wikipedia page. We have got an IMDB page. Uh, this guy, J. Max Slaughter, sang in a boy band called Sons of Harmony, uh, who broke up in 2001. I've never got over it myself. Uh, and, he, and there's uh, another guy here. Look, so we, we actually have found a Dr. J. Max Slaughter. But if you look at the two fellows here, they look kind of similar. Could they be the, the same person? They've got the same name. They've got very different hairstyles. But if you look at the faces, there could be something there, but um, who knows? Uh, but this is a this is a news story about a guy called Dr. Slaughter in Texas, no less. So that's what we're talking about. It's, things are starting to piece together here, maybe. Um, okay, let's let, add it all up. I oh, know we've got one more poll. Sorry, uh, Jess, go for it. Let's. This is the last time uh, we're going to do this. It's your last chance. Do you think this is real or false? Okay, that's everyone. Sorry, I thought there'd be one more. Um, so again, we're majority, two thirds, yes, one third, no. Okay, let's figure. Let's see. Let, I can re now reveal that the story was real. Well done. Well done to the majority of you there. It's true. There was a there was a girl who screamed so loud at a uh, One Direction concert that her lung collapsed and she went to hospital and she was treated by Doctor Slaughter. Um, but yeah, those of you who were who were skeptical, um, the the journalist, the BBC journalist who covered this story, felt the same as you. She wasn't sure that this was uh, this is true. Kate Silver, BBC's reporter, so she got to the bottom of the story by taking a very similar path path to what we did. She first, ask yourself, could it be true? Think, could it be real? Uh, look around for evidence. 
all of those little steps that we went through, Googling around, see who else is who else is covering it. But crucially, she discovered the medical article and doctor, and found Dr. Slaughter. Uh, and she went one step further than, than we would here. She actually gave him a call. She gave Dr. Slaughter a ring. Uh, it's not something we do. This is like this is something for journalists to do. But by getting hold of him and speaking to him directly, she stood the story up, as we say. She found it, found it to be true and solved the mystery of the time lag, which is probably the thing that those of you who thought it was fake was were probably most fixated on, that three-year time lag. And uh, the reason is that these, these medical journals, they, they take a long time to be, the articles that have to be checked, they have to be peer reviewed, as they say, so checked by other clever people. They have to be carefully, uh, make sure every fact is completely true and proven and tested. And then, they, then they're released and they take ages, absolutely ages for these things to come out. And that's why it took so long. So uh, at the time of the incident, the fan herself didn't go public. Uh, with a story, uh, and in fact, she still hasn't identified herself. Um, hence why she's not been named in any of the press reports. So if we just go back through the checks that we did there, and then I think we might have one question in there from what I can see, so we'll, we'll try and come to that. So first of all, we asked, is this real? Just a basic gut instinct feeling. Does this, does this seem real to you? We check for evidence. We look for the, the source, the author of the publication, dates, times, pictures, names, dates, all of those things. I said dates twice there, didn't I? Um, these things all help us to build up the picture. Uh, and again, like I say, like putting pieces of the, the jigsaw together. Uh, then we ask, does it add up? So once we've got all those pieces of evidence, do they add up? Do they back each other up? And the, the sticking point was those things with the dates, wasn't it? That really that was really making us uh, think twice about it. Uh, and lastly, we looked around, check other sources to see if they were carrying the story. This is a useful step, but it's not a it's not a given. Um, just because loads of people are reporting the same thing doesn't necessarily mean it's true. They could have all got it from the same fake source. So, but it's a useful thing to, to do. And then, you know, reputable uh, news sites will have done their own fact checking as well. So it's always worth uh, looking around as well. And if you'll see that we've very cleverly uh, made it, these steps, they all add up to the word real. So you can help re remember them. Is it real? Is there evidence? Does it add up and have you looked around? So. Uh, I'm going to stop talking for a minute. You'll be pleased to hear. Um, we're going to watch a little video and then we'll do some questions. So if you've got any questions, chuck them in the chat uh, while this video is going and we'll see what we can get to. How can I know if a story is real? There are a few things you can do to check out a story. Stop and ask yourself, is this real? Does it feel right to you? What evidence do we have? Who's telling us this information? Where does it come from? And then ask yourself, does it all add up when you look into the details? Do the dates add up? Could the person who's involved in the story have been there at the time? And finally, look around. See if anyone else is reporting it. If no other major news organisations are reporting something that seems like a big, shocking story, you might want to be careful. So what about stories I see on social media? Look at the language that people are using. Are they using lots of capital letters, exclamation marks, random characters? How long have they had the account? Do they link to a website where you can see more information about them? Is the account verified? On lots of platforms now, there's a little blue tick next to the username, which says that this has been verified by that service. And thirdly, cross-check. Can you find this person elsewhere on the internet? Who else have they talked to? What else have they talked about? When you're looking at pictures and video on social media, uh, my top tip would be always check the source. Who's posted it? Where have they posted it? The time that it's posted? But my ultimate tip is you can always reverse search a picture and see how many times that picture has been used before. If it's been used lots before, it might not be original. It may have even been used for another story. We all have a role to play in making sure that what we share in the digital space is accurate and trustworthy.
Okay, I think that's an important part to remember at the end there from my, my colleague Alex there, who's, who says we all got a role to play in this. So, you know, we're all we're all part of this uh, e information ecosystem, I suppose you could call it. Where you know, it's not like the old days where the news was just some old guy reading a script from on the telly. It's it, you know, it's we're all part of this now. We can we can all click a button and reach thousands, millions of people if the, if the circumstances are right. So yeah, I think the mantra is you know if you're not sure, don't share. It's, it's the it's a, it's a really easy easy one to remember. Um, I can see a, a a message in the chat. Yeah. Have we got a question? We do. How long does it take to write articles? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, it, of course, it varies massively. Um, I've spent months on one one article. I've spent uh, today. I spent. 20 minutes writing writing an article it depends on how much research you've got to do it depends uh yeah how long the article is going to be so you know you can write you know on the on the bbc website uh, and it would tell you um we you know you can have these long reads which are you know require a, a commitment from the reader who's going to have to sit there for 10 15 minutes to read those things obviously take a lot longer there's a lot more details to to check up on and it depends again what you're what you're reporting on so today i had to report on just a video message that I'd seen online. Uh, someone, someone important had, had posted this message. I just had to relay what he he'd said in the message and put a bit of context to it. That's nice and easy. If you're fact checking, if you're taking material from a load of sources, that's going to take a lot longer. So it, it, yeah, of course it, it, it varies massively. Um, but you know, some editors don't realise that. <laughs> and we'll just have another uh, question, Paul. Um, go on, go. For it. What is the best way to start a career in journalism? Best way. Um, how did you start, I guess? <laughs> how did I start? It's not necessarily the best way, but um, <laughs> how did I start? I, well, I got a job at the BBC um, kind of not, not far out of uni. Um, I, I got a job in an admin, admin role. It was nothing to do with news either. It was like it was uh, in, in TV, but not even that glamorous. It was, I'll tell you what I was doing. I was booking taxis for people to, much more important me than me to come and do their job. That was pretty much the job. But that's often the way, you know, I, le I learned, I, I had an admin job in another firm. I, I found this BBC job, which is an admin thing, got in that way. And then I found this, this weird little organization called Monitoring who were doing news and, and, I, and I got in that way. Um, I think, that, you know, there's loads of other routes. Maybe the other uh, BBC guys here would be able to chip in here. Um, local radio is a good one. Uh, hospital radio, any community projects like that. Local newspapers, just to, to cut your teeth in any way you can. Just get used to the act of researching and uh, and putting together stories. If you've got a if you've got a nose for a story, if you if you've got this instinct in you that you want to explain things to people, explain things that are going on, those are all really useful. And now we have social media as well. Oh, now we are so how old do I sound? Social media has been around for ages, but you've got these tools on on something like um, on TikTok where you can make your own stuff. You can put special effects on and on all this stuff. You can you can annotate a video. You you can do all these things to uh, new ways of, of of telling stories. So just find any way that you can to to tell those stories and get that get that material out there. I know, Alison, did you have something to add there? Um, well, I was just going to say if the other guys want to come on as well and answer any questions about how they started. I mean, there's many different there's many different paths, really. Some people went to university. Some people have done apprenticeships. Um, some people have entered into different organizations in different ways. Um, I did a, um, a journalism degree um, and then my first job in the BBC was as a receptionist. Um, and I worked up that way and I've moved around in lots of um, different different places. I've made tea for many a politician. Um, so there are lots of different ways to get in. Um, does anyone else want to chip in? I can talk about the apprenticeship scheme in a little bit, but does anyone else want to want to chip in and say how they started in the BBC? I can say yeah. something, Alison, if you like. Oh, OK. James yeah. here. Go for it, James. Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a journalist um, at the BBC as well, everybody. Um, I've been in this job as a journalist for about 25 years, actually, working in different parts of the BBC. Um, I went to, to university. Um, I didn't study journalism. I, I studied English and drama, actually. And then I got a, a job as a, as a trainee journalist in a local radio station, which was my first job after university. When I was at university, I we had a, a university radio station, a campus radio station, which I sort of did a bit of DJing on and learned how to 
write a, a news story and how to read a news bulletin, that sort of thing. But I know that nowadays, and they didn't have this years ago, but nowadays the BBC does have these apprenticeship schemes, which means that university is not is not um, uh, the only way in. So there are definitely ways to get in without, without uh, getting a degree. But I would say that the main thing to do is just to demonstrate that you have an interest and a passion for it. So if you can be at school and writing for your school newspaper or school magazine, writing yourself a blog, um, you know, making little videos, working for a, a, a charity or a community group, you know, writing up little newsletters for them, anything to show that you've got a real interest in telling stories and, and, and showing your writing skills. Thanks, James. I know you were about to say something yeah. as well. Yeah, I, I started my uh, career in India where I studied and I actually studied uh, sociology and social work and uh, then opted to change tracks and uh, decided that was not what I wanted to do long term and uh, joined a, a magazine and started there with uh, writing. I, I realized that I had a passion for talking to people, for listening to stories and uh, for telling them. And that was the first trigger. I just liked meeting, hearing stories. And that to me, being curious is really important. And I think if you are curious about people and their, what's happening in their lives and their stories, go for it. Journalism is for you. Oh, thank you. Matt, I saw you come off mute for a second. Did you want to say anything? <laughs> Yeah, I was just going to agree with... We can, see, can you come off camera? Can we see you? Oh, yeah, sorry. I was just going to uh, agree with the other guys, really, and just say, uh, without sort of giving my life story, but certainly the more uh, you do in terms of school magazine, you know, I got involved in things like that, school magazine, uh, or the end of year sort of... Uh, end of year um, journal type thing, or I did hospital radio, um, student magazine when I went to university as well. So just, yeah, getting involved in all that sort of, uh, you know, any opportunity really to try and get involved in uh, and just get your hands dirty really and just, and just see what it's all about. And as Anu said, if you're a, I guess if you're a people person, um, it's a really great job. Yeah, because it's, it, you know, you're talking to different people, you meet all sorts of different characters every day. So if you're, Know, if you're a people person then it would be it'd be a great job but yeah that's uh, my advice would be that just get involved as much as you can and in, in, in doing as much as you can even now even at you know at school age you could, there's loads you can do yeah no as everyone said um th this time is the best time for you guys because you don't actually whilst it's always good to work at organizations be it community radio or the bbc or sky or anyone like that you guys don't actually need organizations to put out media you know you want to set up um if you really like writing set up a blog if you like putting together videos and editing videos set up a youtube page you know you can do them on social media as long as you're all of the age i should say um and that's actually a really good way of building what we call a portfolio so if you ever do then go to an organization and say oh, i'm really interested in this you know if you're applying for an apprenticeship or even if you're applying for a degree um and you want to show that you're really interested in it you can show them your portfolio i mean if even if you have like an instagram page and you put together little video clips um, it shows that you know camera angles, it shows that you know how to tell a story really quickly, it shows you know how to edit, you know, you don't need to have hundreds of thousands of followers, you could have five followers and you know that be your mom, your cousin and your next door neighbor and your two best friends. But if you're putting something out consistently, it just shows that actually you, you really are dedicated to what you're saying you want to do. And you're honing your craft. I mean, if you start off with a blog, and you say you started writing a year ago and you're like, this is my first, this is my first blog. And I appreciate that it's not very good. And I can see now the mistakes, but a year later, this is the work that I'm doing that shows progression. And so that's not an embarrassing thing. That's that just shows that you've stuck with it um, and you're dedicated to the course. So all those kind of things are good ways to start really. There's one question about pay. I'll leave that to Paul. <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> so who's going to take that one? Oh, yeah. Someone's asked, is it good pay in the BBC? <laughs> there's worse. There's worse paid, paid jobs out there. Well, you can get paid worse and you can get paid better. Yeah. <laughs> in any walk of life. 
Yeah, I'd I'd I'd, I'd certainly say it's not a job that you do for the money. Mm. Um, it's a job you do because you end up just really enjoying your job. Um, I mean, there are, obviously, if you want a, a job for the, for the money, you'd go and become, I don't know, a solicitor or a doctor or something, you know, far sort of uh, uh, perhaps more fancy. But it's a sort of job that I found that I've just enjoyed every day that I've I've worked as a journalist. Um, you don't you, know, you get stressful days, but it's, it's an enjoyable job to do. Definitely. And if if you're a people person, even when I had to make PT for politicians and people coming in to do interviews, it was just interesting to hear different people's stories, um, especially people, especially ordinary people. And it's like, oh, what are you coming to Westminster to talk about? And they're coming to talk about, you know, something that's happened in their community and it's really affected them. So they're trying to make a difference. And it's always interesting to hear people's stories. So yeah, if you're a people person, you will, you will enjoy the job most definitely. You definitely have to make a few cups of tea in the early days, don't you? Tea is mandatory. Tea Learn how to make tea, a good cup of tea. <laughs> That's the first step. I think we should not undervalue tea making. No, like some of a... my best conversations and friendships are at the tea bar. It's true, actually. And it also, it helps you... Um, learn how to kind of connect with people and make people comfortable like you get the best interviews out of people if they feel that you actually genuinely care about what it is you're saying and you're not out there to trick them you're not out there to you know trip them up you genuinely want to know what their story is and put that across so actually you are right never underestimate a cup of tea and if there's a bicky as well you're golden Right. I'm quite conscious of time. We've got another exercise, but I think we've only got six minutes left, right, Jess? Yeah, but I mean, this is quite a fun one. So if, if you've got time got to time do it, it in six minutes, <laughs> it's a new record. OK, right. Where is it? We'll, we'll skip that video. OK, so I'm going to show you four tweets that, uh, that came out during the, the pandemic. We're going to do it really quickly. Um, they're all about animals kind of taking over, taking back control of um, various areas after the humans were all locked in their in their houses so if, i don't know if you remember lockdown it feels like years ago but apparently it's quite recent um so the first one we've got are these goats uh herd of goats in landudno the herd of mountain goats roam roam the deserted streets of landudno and notice we've got four pictures here uh taken for a, by a press photographer he's got a blue tick verified uh check mark on his account not always a guarantee of um, of quality but is something to take into account. Next one, we've got dolphins swimming in the canals of Venice. Venice hasn't seen such clear water in a long time. Uh, next one, this is a good one. Lions in Russia. Russia unleashes more than 500 lions on its streets to ensure that people are staying indoors during the pandemic outbreak. Okay, and this has been tweeted by uh, Lord Sugar. Uh, and he wonders if it's a wind up. Um, and then there's deer in East London. Um, while the goats in Landudno are getting all the publicity, how about a shout out for these deer um, who have uh, colonized the empty street of Harold Hill in East London. And this is, uh, this is tweeted by Billy Bragg, 1980s singer songwriter, very much the, the one direction of his, of his day. Um, he's also got a blue tick and we've got three pictures there. So uh, we've got a poll for this one, Jess. I think we do, don't we? So um, um, there's no, it's not that one of them's true, one the rest aren't, um, some of them are true, some are not. So just tell me which ones you think are true. Oh, I think that's one. <laughs> there we go. No one's going for the lions. How <laughs> disappointing. Okay, so we've got eight people saying the goats, we've got seven saying the dolphins, and we've got six saying the deer. Okay, that's not bad. Um, yeah, the lions, unfortunately, wasn't, it's not true. Uh, I mean, he's, he's done some crazy things, Putin, but he hasn't gone that far yet. Um, what, what happens with it? So that one is actually is, is false and someone's actually created that screen grab. They, they took this, they managed to find this picture and you can get these things online 
where you're going to add sort of fake breaking news captions to things to make them look more legitimate. But when the story is this ridiculous, it's, it's not really going anywhere. Um, this this lion was real, um, but it was uh, on a film set in South Africa, uh, nowhere near Russia at all. Um, the dolphins. Ah, sorry, not true. They they were dolphins. Uh, they're real dolphins. Um, but they were in Sardinia. They weren't in Venice. They didn't venture into Venice just yet. They weren't in the canals. Um, so those ones weren't true. But the other true, the other two, well done, eight of you and six of you, the deer and the goats were were true. And maybe you just went through that same process. You thought, is it possible? You know, of course it's possible that goats in Wales could suddenly uh, go into the, in, into the streets. And um, the other thing we've got there, we've got four pictures. And in the, and the other one, we've got three pictures. Uh, and this is because if you were, you know, if you do see something a bit mad out of the ordinary on the streets that you're going to, um, you think you're going to post into social media, you wouldn't just take one picture of it. You'd probably take several and then, and then put them in there. And of course, we've got the blue check marks as well, though, although even though that didn't really work for um, Lord Sugar, he, yes, it was a wind up, Lord Sugar, yes. So um, well done, everyone there. I think we're down to two minutes. I don't know, we've, have we got any more questions that I quickly do? Or oh, Alison, do you want to talk about? Any further stuff that we can we can plug? Sorry. Thank you. Um, uh, Jess, did you get the slides I was sending you? I was having a bit of trouble. Oh no, not yet. But what what I'll do is um, I will I will share everything that you send with us. So well, it was just to say that um, here at the BBC we do do apprenticeship schemes. Um, you have to be over eighteen, so it's something for you to think about and in your next steps as opposed to today um, but all the things that we've been saying you know if this is something that you're interested in try and get some experience of doing little bits now whether you can volunteer at a local community radio station or you can write your own blogs you know all that kind of experience is good and all that goes towards your portfolio um, Jess will share the slides about the various different apprenticeship schemes we do but just to quickly say that if journalism doesn't sound like your thing, um, we have apprenticeships on all sorts because really in the BBC and in the creative media in general, there are jobs, there are jobs for pretty much everything. I think probably with the exception of being a doctor or a surgeon, unless you're gonna consult on casualty or doctors or something. Um, but you know, we have lawyers, we have, we have accountants, we have HR. If you're interested in hair and makeup, then obviously we need those kind of people on sets. There's cameras, technical, IT, you know, pretty much everything you can think of um, is possible in the BBC and the creative industries in general. So don't just think, oh, I don't want to be in front of a camera or, oh, I don't particularly think I like news. Um, think of the kind of things that you do like to do and then, and then look around at the different apprenticeship schemes. And um, even when you're looking at like the television, Think of all the possible jobs that could be behind it and then think if that's something that you'd be interested in or not. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your time this evening. That was such a great session. Thank you, Paul and Alison and everyone from the BBC. It's been great to have you here this evening. Um, and yeah, and as, as Alison said, um, we will send you some more information after today. Um, and if you have any other questions, and obviously please feel free to email us at our Creative Futures address, um, because we can always put those questions to the BBC team. Um, but just a quick reminder about what else is coming up on the programme. Um, next week is our trip to the Creative College in Bristol. Um, so those of you in Swindon um, will be able to come on the coach with us. There's still some places left. So if you'd like to come with us, please do sign up by the by Friday. Um, but also, if you're not from Swindon, you're also more than welcome to go along. And we have shared information about how to join the Taste Today um, independently. Um, and then we're back again virtually on the 20th of April. So that might still be the Easter holidays for some of you. Um, we'll be back with Ravensbourne University from London. And again, they'll be talking about the wide range of different creative careers. Um, and they've got some student ambassadors as well coming along so you can get your questions answered as well. And we've also got some other sessions coming up soon at the University of South Wales about creative design and fashion. Um, and we'll be ending our webinar series with the Bristol Old Vic as well. So we really hope that you join us for some of those. Um, if you don't mind, as always, we love your feedback. So if just before you go, I'm just going to launch our final poll. <laughs> um, and if you have any questions, and then obviously please pop them in the chat or email us. But um, if you wouldn't mind just answering those before you head off. But otherwise, thank you all so much for joining us. A huge thank you again to the BBC Young Reporter team. It's been amazing to have you. 
um, and we will see you all soon. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.